So I've always been into history. Uh, as a kid, my parents would take me to antique stores instead of Chuck E. Cheese. I would watch the History Channel all the time, and I would play Indiana Jones on repeat until I broke the VHS tapes. But as I got older, I decided to get into something a little more daring. That was urban exploring. Urban exploring, you go out through abandoned buildings uh, and facilities and uh, like power plants, hospitals, mental asylums, things like that, and you take a photo of what's left behind. You try not to take anything there, that's bad. During the early days of the internet, aka MySpace age, uh, I took all these photos and I started posting them online, and I learned of a huge community of other urban explorers. One of the people I met was this guy named Matt. Matt sent me a message, was like, hey, do you want to go to this really big, abandoned, massive like, plant out in the middle of nowhere with me? Yes, strange man from the internet, I will. <laughs> and thankfully, Matt did not uh, kill me, uh, and I didn't kill him. And we developed like this great bond. We would go, we would go exploring all over the United States. Uh, and even our travels took us overseas to Chernobyl. Uh, yes, this is before it became the radioactive Disneyland that it is now, thanks to the HBO TV show. So after doing all that, I kind of took a break. I focused on my career in cybersecurity. And up until, I guess, March of 2020, that's all I did. But like everyone else here, you got kind of bored during COVID, and you had to find something else to do. You wanted to get out of the house. Well, Matt was in the woods one day, and he posted a photo of a bottle that he found on the ground. It was an antique beer bottle, and I was like, that's really cool. So I sent him a message and asked him, like, hey, where'd you find this at? You know, what's the story behind this? Did you just get it at an antique store or something like that? He goes, no, they're just laying all over the place. That was, like, fascinating to me. I can just go out in the woods and find antiques instead of going to the store to buy it. I was all in from that point on. So we go out the following day. We start hiking. We pull up beer bottles, medicine, sodas, all from the early 1900s. This is the greatest hobby ever. I'm out in the woods, I'm getting antiques, I'm a happy camper. As we're continuing this, we learn that this hobby of ours actually has a proper name. It's called relic hunting, or bottle digging, depending on which version you're doing. This version that we're doing involves us going outside, looking for former uh, like landmarks, like buildings, homes, businesses that are long gone. We use our skills from urban exploring, matching up satellite imagery, to places that we now know on the maps from back in the day, like churches and rivers, to find the locations of all these places. One day we're in the woods hiking, and I literally trip over a bottle. It's the best day ever. I pick it up, and by this point we had really gotten good at identifying bottles and knowing what they are. This one I pick up, it says Heinzlinger and Company. Never heard of it. Looks cool though. Put it in my backpack, keep moving. We get a couple more beer bottles and sodas throughout the day. I eventually get back home, and I pull up the bottle and I start researching it. I go to Enoch Pratt's website. I don't know if you guys know this, but they have an archive of all the Baltimore Sun articles going back to 19, or 1837, which is awesome. So I pull it up, I type it in, boom, Heinzlinger Company, 1880, 1890, got all the articles. But there's one article that stands out, one that was from 1901. And I was like, why is there this one article from 1901 when this company went out of business in 1900? So I open it up, and I see that Heinzlinger's son had been called to be a witness for an execution. Now, if you're here in Baltimore City, you know that you get jury duty every year. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's think about you getting execution duty every year, too. Jury duty is not that bad anymore. <laughs> so after I see this, I want to know, like, what's the story behind this execution? Who's the person? I start going through old case records and everything like that, and this is what I find. On uh, October 27, 1900, a man walking down near uh, where M&T Bank, Bank Stadium is on Baynard Street finds a woman with her head caved in. Laying next to her was a bloody cobblestone. This man runs to the police and tells him, hey, there's a body over here. Come investigate. The police officer rolls up. He's like, hey, I know her. That's Mrs. Butler. Mrs. Butler was, was at one point married to a John Butler. John Butler was an upstanding citizen in Baltimore City. He was part of, he was the president of the Young Black Republican Group here in Baltimore City. This is before Republicans switched sides. <laughs> just a little, just a little head, just a little background information for y'all here. So, and so I'm looking at this and the police officer goes, without any other questions, he does ask the, the, the man that witnessed it or found the body, did you see anyone leaving this area? He said, I saw a black man, that was it. This is a predominantly black neighborhood. Okay. So, with that information, the police officer is like, you know what? I got this. It's John Butler. Case closed. What? No. That's not how this should work out. 
But this is how it does. John was arrested at his friend's house, which was over on the other side of the city. You guys know how hard it is to get across the city these days. Back then, it was even harder. So there's no way that John made it across town and look at split like that. But the police officer finds him, arrests him. Within two months, the city of Baltimore finds John guilty on nothing but circumstantial evidence. John is sentenced to death. So that's December of 1901. Throughout that time, as he sat in Baltimore City Jail on Murder Row, he lost a lot of weight, got very weak, and he was only visited by one person, his reverend. His reverend came to him and said, John, if you confess, the state will just give you a life sentence. We will not execute you. John John maintained his innocence. He said, you know what? I did not do this. I'm not going to confess anything I did not do. Up until the day before his uh, execution on August 23rd, 1901, the, pa- the reverend came back once more and said, John, you're about to die. Confess. That's it. Go to, your, go to heaven or hell, wherever you've got to go, uh, with an empty you know, heart. And John said, if I had done this, I would have told you a long time ago, but I did not do this. John was so weak the following day that sheriff's deputies had to pick him up and carry him to the gallows. He was unable to stand, so they placed a chair on top of the gallows trap doors. They sat John in this chair put a rope around his neck. Seconds later, the sheriff pulled the lever, and John fell to his death. He sat there dangling for minutes as John Hunslinger's son watched in the audience. He was buried at a grave in Westport, Baltimore. And, you know, if it wasn't for finding this bottle, John's story would have completely been forgotten because no one would have looked him up. No one would have known anything about this case. And yet, I look at it as a black man, as you know, and that deals with the justice system, that nothing's really changed in the last 121 years. Everything is still the same. And unfortunately, John's memory was only found by me. 